Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm James Milan. I am talking one-on-one -on -one, uh, with Lynette Martin, who is a candidate for school committee. Um, and we've got lots of ground to cover, so we'll get right into it. Lynette, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, wanted to address, since we last spoke to you at the debate, um, it's been a busy time uh, for you, I'm sure, in that, among other things, a mailing went out into most people's, uh, or maybe every household in Arlington, uh, that has, you know, elicited a certain uh, response because people were concerned about the Im impression that you gave uh, in that mailing. So I want to give you an opportunity just to, to talk about that and uh, what you have learned um, yeah. and how you're moving forward. Absolutely. So um, I sent out a mailing and it, my first mailing as a first time candidate and uh, I messed up. Uh, the return address label said time sensitive materials, um, absentee ballot information uh, available. And um, I neglected to put my name. I just had my home address. Uh, it was an oversight and um, I really wanted to make sure that everybody knew about the absentee ballot uh, expanded opportunities, which it says on, on my mailer, expanded absentee ballot information. Please uh, go to the website for more information. And the timing was unfortunate because it was right before the town had um, decided to send out postcards, but I did not know that when the mailing was created. It was created before that. So um, it's particularly upsetting to me because my campaign is really built on a foundation of transparency and communication. Uh, I'm definitely all about that. And um, I think that can be seen in my actions. I have for years before even this campaign started been out on social media, listservs, you know, posting school committee meeting notes, uh, advising people of important meetings and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I've put phone calls into the town manager, into, uh, some of the select board members and candidates apologizing. And, um, you know, we learn from mistakes and I'm happy to um, take the lessons learned about remembering to sort of slow down, to go back to the people I'm collaborating with and bring those lessons to my tenure on the school committee. Okay, thank you. And um, just to be 100% clear, I, what you're saying is really there's, because some folks have expressed concern that this, that you had to know what you were doing in a sense, but what you're saying is really, you, you, you really didn't and it was a result. No, it was a total oversight. There had been a million eyes on the contents of that mailing, we had all reviewed it. And then I got a last minute call from the mail house being like, what do you wanna put on the envelope? And um, you know, I have a business background. I was like, I wanna make sure that people see this absentee voting information. I'm very concerned about the disenfranchisement of voters. Um, so I put that on there, but clearly, you know, it was a mistake and um, I think my past actions, people who know the work that I've done, know that um, all I want is to make sure that everybody has a voice and so it was absolutely an oversight, not like a premeditated anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. Okay, and very quickly, one other thing that we want to just clarify before moving on to some other issues, and that is there's been a, a small controversy, I would say, coming out of the debate um, because of numbers that you had cited um, within the debate, and then Mr. Schlickman in particular's reaction uh, to those, in which he has alleged that your the numbers that you were using were either patently false um, or at least inaccurate. Um, what is your response to that? Yes. Um, I find that whole thing sort of saddening, disappointing. Um, all of the numbers that I stated in the debate are direct from the Massachusetts State Department of Education, the DESE website, the same website that Mr. Schlickman um, sends people to. I put a response letter where I link directly to all of the numbers. Uh, there was one slight misstatement when I was replying to something that someone said, so not part of my notes or anything, where I stated that our Asian students at the high school were um, disciplined at a rate five times that of our white students. Um, actually, that year it was 5% of Asian students, but our Asian students were in fact disciplined at 2.6 times the rate of our white students. Um, and so I've corrected that in that article. Um, but regardless of that, um, the data that the state has provided us um, is compelling, and I think that it should not be ignored. And again, I feel it's important that you know we talk about these inconvenient numbers. Um, we 
bring these conversations to the foreground. And um, I feel that arguing over whether or not they're statistically significant just does more damage. Um, the, the numbers are si significant. Um, our SPED students who, uh, special needs students who make up 16% of the student population, make up 47% of our suspensions. Our high need students make up 61% of our suspensions. And uh, regardless of the number of Asian students in the, the compiling, um, our students of color make up 30% of our student population, but 42% of our suspensions. So um, there is an overall pattern here that I think is important to look at and to talk about solutions. So I'm interested in talking about solutions and just bringing the conversation to the table. Uh, this uh, school district or any specific teachers or administrators or school committee members, I'm not doing that at all. I'm just saying, hey, this is the data out there. I think we should look at the data and hey, here are a whole list of ideas for solutions I have that I want to look at during my tenure on the school committee. So um, that's what that's about. Okay. Um, and you stated, you know, quite clearly uh, in the debate that the search for a new superintendent uh, was either the primary or a very uh, important uh, motivation for you to run. Um, so tell us a little bit more about what role you see for yourself. Uh, should you be elected in that search, what is it that you are going to be bringing to that search uh, that other people wouldn't, for instance? Thanks, I'm really glad that you brought that up in this discussion. Um, I really believe that the hiring of the superintendent is like, the most important thing that we're gonna be doing this coming year. The new superintendent's gonna set the course for APS, the vision, um, our, what we're looking to do for the next decade or more. And um, I'm committed to a few things. I wanna make sure we find a superintendent who is very much about transparency and communication. Just last night, there had been um, a town forum for uh, APS where we talked to elementary school um, parents and caregivers about um, what's been happening with distance learning and today on social media there's a lot of parents who are disappointed with the response feel like there's still you know the format um, there's still not enough communication happening and uh, I had hosted a listening session for parents several weeks ago because there seemed to be a real need for parents to talk it was an amazing experience you know parents talked about what was working for them and what was not working for them and i really think we need to tap into these experiences because ultimately the biggest stakeholder in all of this is our children and families really understand that i also want to make sure that um, we look for somebody who is um, ideally has some experience dealing with disparity gaps in their prior school districts and someone who's data driven and also who is proactive and wants to look at solutions sort of like enrollment, um, you know, what, what distance learning is going to do for the future next year, you know, really is proactive at looking at solutions in the future, um, you know, no matter how difficult that might be, sort of having a, a grasp with that. And I also bring a lot of hiring experience to this. I've hired teachers before. Um, I've worked as an exec, the director of education, I'm sorry, I've worked as a director um, for an educational nonprofit. And so um, I've hired executives in the educational nonprofit sector. And I also want to bring sort of that uh, diversity lens, make sure that we're hiring without, uh, with the minimum amount, amount of biases as possible. Um, you know, one of the other thing, well, not one of, the biggest thing uh, that we're all dealing with and that we will be dealing with in the fall and beyond is of course coming out of to whatever whatever that means, the yeah. pandemic and what the effects of that are likely to be. Um, obviously, you can't have any answers. Um, I'm wondering what in your mind are both the biggest challenges that we are likely to face and uh, are there opportunities there? Are there things that we may have learned coming out of the pandemic that we can employ to our benefit? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So um, there are obviously so many challenges and I, um, I don't envy the, the job ahead of our uh, current superintendent um, of our town leadership. Um, I, I can see everybody is, you know, doing their best and, um, 
and nobody has answers. Not only do we need to wait for certain things from the state, but um, you know, we, need to, we don't know where this is going. So one of the biggest challenges is gonna to be to figure out how to incorporate families that might be able to return to the school system with those that won't be able to return at the same time. Because ultimately, when we do return, there will be families who have immunocompromised family members that um, can't directly go back. And so how do we incorporate them into the classroom and provide equity for both sets of kids? Um, but the learning piece of this is that, um, you know, these equity issues have always existed. Um, there are just more of them now. You know, not only do we have to deal with equity issues for our economically disadvantaged families, our non-native English speaker families, um, families that have um, special needs students with specific uh, needs that we may or may not be able to do uh, remotely, but also there's like a whole new set of people that like have access issues. You have essential workers. You have families dealing with COVID and COVID in their family. So something that you know this does is it brings us forward for addressing the needs of um, people that have not been able to access meetings before, like. There have been uh, people in our, in our community with disability issues that prevent them from attending a select board meeting. So I hope that some of this we will bring forward to accommodate those folks and be able to bring them into um, the decision making that's happening in our town, uh, better hear their voices. Um, I wanna make sure that we look at every decision we make on the school committee and say, okay, so whose voices are not represented here? Who hasn't been invited to the table? Because it's not enough to say like, oh, anyone is welcome here. You need to make sure that people know that they have access to this and that their voices are um, wanted and respected and um, valued. Um, you know, in the three minutes or so, less than that, I guess, remaining for us, um, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about things beyond, a vision beyond um, the fall and the immediate issues we have in front of us. And specifically, what changes that you would like to see happen within the school system to create a, a, an engaging and relevant 21st century education for our students? Absolutely. So um, I think that all of this ties into making sure that we address the disparity gaps. But it's not just about um, the student needs that we're not meeting are high need students. Um, there's all sorts of students who, um, you know, I hear from parents with gifted children. One thing that I think is very exciting is that we were just recently selected among uh, 12 different school districts to be part of a consortium called the Maple Consortium. I'm gonna look at the, I always forget what Maple specifically stands for. It's the Massachusetts Personalized Learning EdTech Consortium. And they're working on improving personalized instruction for our special needs students. And so I think personalized instruction, instruction is really key. I'd like to see what we can do with that for all of our students to provide more personalized level of instructions, meeting our students where they're excited about learning um, in the best way to reach them and sort of uh, moving forward with uh, individualized um, motivations. Um, so I think that's one, one excellent thing that I'd like to see what we do with that. Uh huh. And is that something that, that uh, you can see as scalable to, you know, be able to provide that kind of experience um, across, uh, you know, ac across the board in a sense um, for the students in, in our public schools? I mean, I am not an expert in curriculum, so I would like sure. defer to the curriculum leaders on that. But certainly um, from my teaching experience, I think that there are tools and techniques where we can look at how we can personally engage and excite um, all of our students. Every child has their own individual needs and the more we can tap into those, the better, the more excited they're gonna be about learning and the more successful that they will be in their future and that we will be as a school overall. Um, I suspected this was going to go by quickly, and it has. And uh, so we want to thank you for your time. Thank um, you. I have been speaking with Lynette Martin, who is a candidate for school committee here in 2020 in Arlington. Um, I'm James Milan. This is ACMI. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.